Hey everybody, Joel Duff here. Today we're just taking the, we'll call it a little foray into the heart of the young earth creationist thinking about the concept of organisms being created according to their own kinds. Yes, what is a kind? You've probably heard of this phrase before, especially if you've been engaged with creationist literature or debates about origins, but what does that word really mean, created according to their kinds? Where does the idea come from and how does that shape young earth creationist understanding of life's diversity? Now we're really gonna explore this topic by just going back to 1946. And we're gonna examine a book, The New Delivialism, uh, and see how kinds or biblical kinds are described in 1946 and relate that to, and maybe talk a little bit about what does a kind mean today? Now, I got this crazy image behind me, um, this image of, hmm, how should I say it? Maybe feathered dinosaurs, or are these just birds, or are these just dinosaurs? What kind of organisms are these? Are these multiple different types of organisms or kinds of organisms that are separate creations? Uh, are they one giant family of things that could all actually be related to each other by common ancestor? These are the types of questions that really everybody asks themselves, but young earth creationists in particular are interested in relating to this concept of kinds, what a biblical kind is, that uh, all the kinds of organisms were created in the beginning. So therefore, knowing what a kind constitutes, what the, what the boundaries of a kind are, are very important for being able to distinguish one thing that God has created separately from another thing that God has uh, presumably created in the Young Earth Creationist interpretation of Genesis 1 and 2. All right, so I'm going to kick it off by uh, talk, giving a little history as to why this particular book uh, is a good place to start, or at least think about uh, what a creationist kind means. It also gives me a chance to um, make up for some maybe misconceptions that I've had in the past. Um, you really can learn from history, and uh, this historical errors tend to repeat themselves, right? And I've, I've made a few errors uh, by not understanding the full history of the development of the idea of kinds from a young earth creationist perspective. So I hope to repair that damage a little bit here. All right, to start this off, let's start with Todd Wood's blog. Um, Todd Wood is a young earth creationist who has written a lot and thought a lot about created kinds. He also is uh, oversees one of the largest, if not the largest, collection of young earth creationist literature and books, uh, and has a very keen interest on understanding the history of young earth creationism and documenting that history. So he's written a lot of really interesting blog posts that relate to this. Now this one, to me, was particularly interested because, and this one's particularly interesting to me because he's specifically responding to me and talking to me about what he perceived as some misconceptions that I had about the nature of a kind and what young earth creationists have thought kinds were, uh, responding to a peer-reviewed article that I published in 2020. You see, this blog post is from 2020. Um, and he was not wrong uh, in several of his observations, and he and I have had some discussion about that but I'm here to further make amends for some misconceptions that I had in the past. The 1946 book that we're gonna look at is The New Delivialism. And Todd Wood has actually talked about this book before as well. He has a blog post on it, really fascinating blog post about a conflict within the Seventh-day Adventist Church on uh, creationism. They had their uh, very uh, public squabbles about different interpretations of of how to be a young earth creationist, I'll, I'll say it that way. Uh, they were all young earth creationists, but very big debates about uh, the nature of the flood and so forth. And, and we're gonna get to one of those differences in this particular book. Um, so The New Delivialism by Harold Clark uh, is, and Harold Clark is a Seventh-day Adventist teacher. And that's this book right here. Uh, I don't know if you could see that, but the new delivery, this would be my copy. Now, I need to tell you something about um, this book, and I, I have a big shout out and thank you to Professor Mark Wilson, um, professor of paleontology at uh, the College of Wooster uh, here in Wooster, Ohio. And he, I recently got together with him, uh, and he donated to me uh, on several boxes of Young Earth Creationist uh, material, all right, things he's collected over time. Uh, and 
I very much appreciate uh, those things. And I'll be covering some other contents uh, that, that he donated to me. But this one in particular really caught my eye because I'd always wanted to take a look at this particular book. What we're going to do is I'm going to read you portions from those last couple pages of the book. The book is mostly about, well, deluvialism. I mean, it's about uh, a explanation for how a global flood could account for the world's geological formations. I mean, that's the primary concern of the text. And there's just a little bit about evolutionary biology at the end. Uh, and his form of deluvialism uh, is contrasted to Price's view of deluvialism, uh, also a Seventh-day Adventist uh, from the 1920s and 30s. Uh, so that, that in itself makes this text very, very uh, interesting because the same divisions can be seen in young earth creationism today in terms of basic positions about the nature of the geological column. Right, but we're not here to talk about the geological column, we're here to talk about created kinds. Now, as I said before, this was precipitated, uh, and my interest in this uh, comes from an article that I wrote uh, back in 2020, uh, published in Evolution Education Outreach. The uh, name of this was Descent with Modification, How Post-Creationism's Claim of Hyper-Rapid speci Speciation Opposes Yet Embraces Evolutionary Theory. A very provocative title. It certainly got some attention uh, from a number of young Earth creationists, uh, uh, not least of which is Todd Wood who has uh, talked about this article a couple times. Um, but the, the gist of this was, uh, was talking about the, the break point or where there's a, how young earth creationists define microevolution versus macroevolution and place microevolution within sort of acceptable evolution. Uh, you know, there's things that actually do happen in the world in terms of adaptation and speciation and so forth. And how far can that speciation go? And I had a number of things to say about how this is a, that for young earth creationists, it's, it's relatively new to have expanded the kind, all right, way out to a family or even broader, saying that, for example, that all cats, right, all felines are all just one kind. They all come from a common origin, right? So they, they have a common ancestor that then gave rise to all the different species of cats, right? And... Uh, I don't want to go too far into this paper because, but this is just to say that um, in this paper, in this particular article, I think I overaccentuated the differences of today's creationists versus maybe 40 years ago or seven, in this case, 75 years ago. Uh, and that there have always been young earth creationists that have had a much broader view of what a kind is. Uh, which goes about out as far as some of today's modern young earth creationists. All right, let's just get right to the book, read some of the text, and that's going to help us inform ourselves or place ourselves in the mind of a nascent young earth creationist movement uh, from the 1920s and 1940s, um, led by, uh, in this case, Seventh-day Adventists. So here we go. The New Deluvialism by Harold Clark, published 1946. Uh, let's just dig right in. As I said before, this is just in the last f maybe five pages in the, in the text. Um, and here he's talking, just introducing the idea of evolutionary theory. He actually has four or five pages before this just to cover like what is the conventional view of like how organisms have changed over time. And this is really fascinating reading because this is from the 1940s. Um, sort of his pers his perspective on what he thinks most people or most evolutionary biologists believe about how organisms have adapted and changed in, changed in this world. And so we pick it up with Harold Clark then summarizing the strength of the, the concept of natural selection, right? So he's talked about uh, evolution in this, in what he would think of as the broader writ idea of everything being evolved from a common ancestor. But then when he comes back and says, what about natural selection itself, the mechanism itself? So let's pick it up right here where he says, knowingly or unknowingly, the principle of the survival of the fittest, that's his way of saying natural selection, is recognized by all for of two forms, if you have two different individuals that have different forms, all right, they have different characteristics, right? We, we'd say today in genetic language, you know, two different alleles, two different variants that are expressed. The one better adapted to survive will be more likely to survive. 
the struggle against environmental conditions. More likely, not absolutely, but it, more likely, on average, statistically, out of thousands of individuals, the ones that have the, you know one particular trait are more likely to survive than ones that have another trait. And so the one less fitted to survive will be more likely to perish. All biologists recognize that variations tend to produce changes in form and function. Whenever these changed forms and functions result in greater fitness to meet environmental conditions, the form possessing them is said to have a survival value, right? We'd say greater fitness, right? We have, we have measures of fitness. Um, the presence of these survival values tend to bring about a selection of the best by a survival of the fittest. In these points, Darwin made no error in observation, nor in judgment. Neither did he try to prove his theory by imaginary ideas. Right? This is pretty good props for Darwin here, um, saying that he's not making this up. He's telling his audience, like, you know, I've just spent four pages talking about, like, the overall uh, scope of how organisms have evolved from single cells all the way up to human beings, right, and shown you what evolutionists say about that. But now if we turn our attention to this mechanism that he proposed for how organisms adapt and change and, and even speciate, he made no error in observation, nor in judgment. Neither did he try to prove his theory by imaginary ideas. Now, of course, the emphasis on imaginary ideas is all that other stuff we just talked about in the previous few pages about fish becoming amphibians. Well, that's, that's an imaginary idea. He didn't actually present any evidence for that. But for natural selection, he provided a significant amount of observations, all right, which I don't find any error in those observations. This is what all biologists recognize. I myself being a biologist, well, actually he's more of a geologist, but I recognize that this is what actually happens in the world, right? So then he's gonna go on, he's gonna say, well, why then the objection raised to Darwin? And then he's gonna talk about the limitations of that selective process in terms of generating enough variation or enough uh, enough new versions of things, right, traits, in order to produce different kinds of organisms. So that's going to bring us back around to, like, what is a kind? What's a limit to how far kinds can change? Can one kind become another kind of organism? And of course, for Clark, it was a, it was a very clear no. I mean, it was a very strong rhetoric about how that's impossible. Nothing's, you know, he, he or anyone after him has not shown that that's possible. But he's very willing to preserve the idea that natural selection is a real and true process. I mean, you have creationists today, young earth creationists today, that, that would object to this language right here about uh, Darwin's concept of natural selection because they don't believe natural selection is, is a, a real phenomena, or at least works like this or in this fashion. Okay, but I'm, I'm gonna skip forward a couple paragraphs now. What are some of these evidences that uh, organisms can change? Because that's the real question we're addressing here is like, how much, how much flexibility are there in organisms such that they can change over time? How far can they change? So here, let's see, the material upon which natural selection and isolation may work for the production of new species is furnished by the mutant genes. Okay, so now he's recognizing that Natural selection is a process. Survival of fittest, you're going to have fittest versions of or copies of, of alleles or traits are going to be passed to the next generation. That is going to affect the next generation. Well, where do those variants come from? Well, the production of new species is furnished by mutant genes. You have to have new variation, right? You have to have new variants in order to create new variants to select upon or select against. The limits of which mutations may go are determined by the pattern of the genes for the particular species. Changes which modify the chromosomes beyond the pattern make development impossible to produce sterile offspring, or produce, sorry, make development impossible or produce sterile offspring. Many new kinds are produced by hybridization, but here the limitations for successful propagation are very closely circumscribed. So he's saying, one thing, I think it's notable that he's recognizing that mutations are a source of new variation. Now that's something that you won't hear those words very often spoken by modern young earth creationists, you know, giving credit to mutations for providing variations that can lead to speciation. It's more common now to hear that all the variation that we see expressed in organisms are 
uh, were originally in the original created kind. They didn't evolve. They didn't come into being through mutations. And it's more likely that young, modern young earth creationists are going to appeal to mutations as simply causing degradation, right? They do create new variations, but those variations are either never or so rarely are they ever beneficial. They're never going to be part of helping an organism survive because they're the fittest. And therefore, they can't be responsible for making new species or new kinds, especially. Um, but here we have Clark recognizing at least that mutations provide enough variation that you can generate new species or new variations. Now, he's going to limit you know, how far those species can go. All right, so let's skip ahead a little bit again. According to this definition, evolution is more than mere change. Right? So again, you're going to try to separate um, the making of new kinds of organisms. And we're going to get to like, well, what exactly is a kind? Because that's the whole purpose of this is to talk about what are the limits of a kind and then what are, what are kinds of organisms. Um, just, I, I just have to warn you, you're not going to be terribly satisfied by the answer because it's going to be very nebulous. <laughs> and that's kind of the point of doing this is because the same questions that, uh, and I, I, not everyone's going to make it the next half hour, right? So I'm just going to give you the uh, the big bullet points right here, and then I'll provide my evidence for those bullet points. Um, Marsh is going to, sorry, Marsh, that's another young with creationists that talk about kinds. Uh, Clark is going to um, act like it's very obvious what kinds are without actually giving you any feeling like you know what a kind is. And this is not that dissimilar to where young earth creationism is, creationism is today. Huge amount of discussion about the limits of kinds and how to define kinds, uh, how to understand what a kind is. I would say it's not gotten a whole lot farther you know, over the last 75 years from what we're going to actually see here. So that's, that's, that's what I think is really fascinating about this. Um, all right, back to this, back to the text. According to this definition, evolution is, evolution is much more than mere change. The gradual unfolding and branching out into all the various forms of beings is not fluctuation, but progressive change that must go on continually for almost interminable periods in order to accomplish the differentiation necessary to produce the many forms that now exist. He's trying to explain, like, here's what evolution must do uh, in terms of if you're going to have a, a universal common ancestor. The fact that variation occurs and that it may be at times be of such a nature as to form what might be recognized as new species does not afford sufficient ground for explaining the origin of the major type forms, such as genera, families, or orders. Sorry, that is, that is an important word there, genera. Remember, you have species, and species can be grouped together into genera, like canis is a genus that includes uh, fox, uh, doesn't include foxes, includes wolves and coyotes. Right, and there's a couple other extinct canids, uh, a canis as well. Uh, the foxes are in different genus, but volupes and canis are in the same family, all right, the canidae. Uh, so the question then becomes, what's a kind? Is a kind the species? Is a kind maybe a, gen a genus? Is a kind maybe a family? A family is sort of where Ken Ham and many other young creationists are today. You know, like all those members of the family are one kind, therefore they could have all evolved from a common ancestor. Um, but here he's saying, look, you know, you have variation. Well, we were, everybody recognizes, just like Darwin did, there's variation among all individuals and all species uh, have differences um, between them, right? So variation exists. And he's already admitted that because there's variation, some individual variants are better than others. And so that changes the ratio of different variants in future generations. So that changes organisms. Organisms will change. Now, how much change can occur? Um, he's saying, OK, we could, we could make new species, but it doesn't afford sufficient ground for explaining the origin of the major type forms, so like, like maybe not genera. Right? We can't make new genera. Well, that would limit a kind to, you know, coyotes and wolves are a kind, but uh, foxes are a completely different kind, separately created by God. Uh, not, in other words, there'd have to be a fox on the on Noah's Ark, and there would also have to be a wolf-type thing on Noah's Ark as well, a pair of each. Ken Ham says there's just a pair between the two, which put them all on the same kind. Sorry, being a little repetitive there, but, you know, it's, 
bears repeating. You have to keep thinking about what, what this means. On the other hand, since the idea of immutability of species has been impossible to maintain in the face of the facts, right? Now, what he's referring to is, is an older idea that, uh, again, I think it's, it's very true. Many, uh, many people who don't understand young earth creationism uh, have a wooden view of what young earth creationists believe uh, that, you know, somehow God made all the different species. Um, or that even historically, that's absolutely people thought. I mean, there's variation in thinking even among uh, Linnaeus, who sort of changed a little bit over his time in terms of how he thought about species. By the way, got uh, Linnaeus right over there on my wall. Uh, I'm, he's not really a hero of mine, but, you know, being a botanist, it's like Linnaeus kind of fits. Okay, so where was I? Oh, yeah. I, I, there's sort of this um, misconception that you see all the time, especially on the internet, right, of non-Young Earth creationists criticizing Young Earth creationists, saying, like, how would you get all those species on, the, on Noah's Ark? And, and that's kind of the point of what I'm doing here. It's 1946. Uh, I'm going to show you that somebody like Harold Clark clearly didn't believe that you had to have every single species on the Ark because he believed that species weren't immutable, right, that new species could form. Right, so this is this precedes Morris uh, and uh, Whitcomb and Morris and uh, the Genesis flood and sort of the expansion of young earth creationism in terms of me, you know, reaching a wider uh, evangelical uh, audience um, outside of moving outside of Seventh Day Adventism. Uh, let's continue. On the other hand, since the idea of immutability of species is impossible to maintain in the face of the facts, I just read this, some evolutionists have hastily assumed that belief in direct creation has been dispensed with or else that it has held only by those who are ignorant of the facts, right? Opponents of the creation doctrine are too hastily in their assumption that the admission of any change whatsoever is impossible for their for the creationist, right? Oh, you just admitted there's change. Well, that's like saying, you know, you actually believe in evolution. You say, no, 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 no. We, we, we say that, yes, change can happen. Darwin was right. You know, variation happens. Speciation can happen. But we don't think you can make, uh, you can make species into groups of species that have differences that we recognize as genera. Um, actually, I'm not even sure what right Clark really thinks about that, as you're going to see, because we're going to see some kind of changing of his language even within two pages of text. Um, but certainly modern young earth creationists um, will say like, yeah, you can have change, you can create groups of species that have similar characteristics, which you can hierarchically uh, classify into different genera, and then you put all those genera together into a family. And then some young earth creationists even put several families together into maybe an order of things, a higher level classification, and yet still say that's one kind of organism, and that circumscribes uh, the kind. Um, yeah, continuing on from the, from the end of that paragraph, the earth and its life are observed to change more or less. Throughout the whole period of human thought, men have recorded these changes and have expressed different opinions as to their interpretation. Some have postulated an original creation followed by change. Just how much change might be allowed and one still believe in creation is more or less a problem which can be settled only by long and painstaking investigation. It cannot be settled by arbitrary pronouncement. That's actually wise advice. There's a lot of pronouncements today among some young earth creationists about, yeah, this is what it is, and like we don't really need to discuss this anymore. I think most young earth creationists recognize that this is a very hard topic. Um, and it, it, there's lots of different um, unknowns still. Now, what, what, what to me, again, is fascinating, this is 1946. I don't feel like much has changed in young earth creationism. They have done a lot of painstaking investigation there's there's whole fields of research things like called like you know the, the whole field of what's called barominology but even within that there are subfields like statistical barominology that's a that's a particular method of applying certain kinds of statistics having lots of collecting lots of data and, and having a statistical analysis which allows you to create to, to find segregated groups that are that are discontinuous from other groups and to identify that potentially as a kind of thing, right? But there are other methods of defining a kind and how much you use biblical criteria or whether the biblical criteria trump other things or whether there's enough biblical criteria to even acknowledge what a kind is. I think that's where most creationists are and I think that's where 
it, not just creationists, like all Christians who try to have tried to understand this concept of a meme, uh, have had difficult, have basically not all, but many thought that there isn't just isn't enough information in scripture for us to be certain, to have absolute certainty on this. So he's right. There needs to be investigation. I would say that there's been 75 years of investigation and it's still murky. <laughs> you know, like that's, that's a common question that people ask. What do you mean by a kind? You keep talking about a kind, but how would you, how do you define it? How do you measure it? How do you identify it when you see it? Admitting the difficulties above suggested the creationists may still be reassured by the fact that such views are no more varied or vaguely stated than our evolutionary views. All right, so I just did four or five pages of how like hand wavy evolution is um, in 1946 evolutionary theory. And you see, they have their problems too. And yeah, well, sure, we don't understand what a kind is. We can't define what a kind is. But, uh, you know, we're no worse off right now than the evolutionary biologists. It's like, we're kind of like, you know, running even here. And, you know, let's see how this plays out. Like, let's do a bunch of painstaking investigation. Let's, let's keep up the work. And maybe we will end up having a better, more robust explanation. Okay, now we get down to it. Harold Clark talking about the meaning of a kind, right? Now, this is what he's thinking might be a kind. There's no way to draw an exact parallel between the meaning of the words kind or kinds and our term species. Okay, that's a good place to start. He's, he's making sure that he dispels the misconception, the one that still exists 75 years later, that a kind is a species. Many lay creationists, and I just mean, you know, the person in the pew that here that, that says, uh, I read my Bible. It says the world's 6,000 years old. God created the kinds, uh, created everything. And they just imagine all the different species they know around them. And they think God made, you know, God made the wolf. God made a giraffe. God made, you know, each one of these different species they're thinking of. But that's a, a naive view uh, in the sense of what do young earth creationists who study this type of stuff and really think about it, what do they believe a kind is or what God created? Um, I don't really know of any serious young earth creationists who have studied this, uh, who, who think about uh, the diversity of life, who believe God made any species we see today just the way it looks right now. All right, I got through one sentence. As used originally in the Greek, the word species simply meant kinds in a loose way. The first precise usage of the word species was by John Ray. I talk about this in, in two of my classes that I teach. I show John Ray's uh, original description uh, because when we start talking about what species are and how to define a species. And, and essentially, most of you out there probably, if you were forced to like write down a short description of what a species is, you would write something very similar to what John Ray expressed. And today, that would be called the biological species concept. Um, there are many other definitions of species, but that's the most common one that, especially the one that's taught probably in high school and introductory classes, is that's your first foray into thinking about what species are and what the limits are. It was incorporated by, you know, Carlos Linnaeus. Mm, Linnaeus over there, right? He's identifying species, giving names to species, and of course, you know, came up with the binomial epithet for species, right? Homo sapiens, boa constrictor, Taraxicum officinale dandelions, or striacaflua liquid ambar, one of my favorites, the sweet gum tree, um, and has been a common use since his time. As commonly defined, it is a group of plants and animals with common characteristics and capable of reproducing their kind, right? Reproducing their kind. All right, that sounds simple. You're able to reproduce with other individuals, then you're part of the same kind. What could be easier than that? If you know anything about biology, you know... <laughs> It's not that easy. You know, you got hybridization. You have individuals within the same species sometimes can't reproduce. Uh, you, you, there's lots and lots of exceptions. <laughs> Plus, there's lots of organisms that don't do sexual reproduction, right? They clone themselves. Um, so we could go on and on. I do a couple weeks of lectures on, on this idea of species. We don't need to do that here. What we need to notice is this next part, right? Setting the stage now. Hey, we got this thing called a species. It's not equivalent to a kind. So what is a kind? We haven't really left with what a biblical kind is. He's just, he's just making the point that biblical kinds are not species as understand by, understood by scientists like John Ray and Carl Linnaeus and everybody after them. So here we go. Field naturalists 
people are out in the real world, like looking at the world and looking at organisms, right? They're confronted with the reality of the world. Find that characteristics of different kinds, or you could read species in this case, so mingled that it is extremely difficult to make clear separations and decide exactly what the division should be drawn. It is hard to define where the division between two different species should be. Sometimes it's easy. Most of the time, actually, it's quite difficult uh, to do so. Because of the situation, it's impossible to say that the kinds of genesis correspond to our present species, genera, families, or any other taxonomic group that might be erected. I would like to make, now this, this I love this part. All right, I, I really um, love the fact that he goes to cars in terms of hierarchical classification. And this has to do with a, a little other YouTube channel called Standing for Truth, which loves to use car analogies for uh, talking about hierarchies and change and, and, and a variety of different things. And this isn't exactly analogous, but I totally hear them in my mind when I, when I read this. I would like to use an illustration of a way I understand the expression after his kind or after their kind. In the cat family are several kinds of cats, right? You've got your lion, you've got your tiger, your leopard, your jaguar, your cougar, your lynx, and I'll point out like your sand cat, your African wild cat, and your house cats, right? These have many points in common. Sure, there are common characteristics for cats like retractable claws, right? They're whiskers, type of nose, the way their ears perk up. I mean, now each one of those characteristics is not in itself absolutely unique in the animal kingdom. There are other animals that have those similar traits, but the package of those characteristics is very cat-like. It's like, there's sort of a, what do we call it? The gestalt of the this animal is cat, right? It has catness to it. I show, I show students in my class a species of cat they likely have never seen in their lives unless they're just cat freaks and they know them from uh, some rare museum or from a book, right? And uh, it has a little bit different features than any other cat because I mean, it's a different species. Uh, and I ask what it is and everyone's just like, it's a cat. And I'm like, well, how do you know it's a cat? There's no one characteristic they can look at and go like, because it has this characteristic it is a cat. It's like all the features together make it cat-like. But you can say the same is true for carnivora, the group of carni carnivores, right? Which include cats and dogs. They have similar features as well, giving them a carnivore flavor. But then even within a genus, of course, you also have canis has a different set of characteristics that are common to it than the foxes. I mean, you could look at a fox and a, and a canid, other canid, and, uh, and I could show you multiple different species of those, and you would easily be able to like group ones together and like, those are fox-like. These are dog-like. Um, all right, great. I mean, he's right. There's, you know, there's lots of variation. Now, here, here, here's, here's, here's the good part. These have many points in common, yet it would be hardly safe to say that they have all descended from one pair of cats created in the beginning or he doesn't really talk about the flood, but you also have the same issue with, they would have to come from all the modern ones he's just talking about now, all have to come from just two cats that were on Noah's Ark. And he's pretty much like, well, that's ridiculous. Like, so in 1946, it's like, that doesn't make any sense at all, right? It would hardly be safe to say that they all descended from one pair of cats created at the beginning. To do so would make the family the original kind Right, because if they all came from a common ancestor, if they all relate to one another, not just in they have an appearance like each other, but they actually are the same thing, then they're one kind, God's original version. At present, each of these kinds is in a separate genus. Right, he actually is, the ones he picked out are actually separate genera, and that's true, those are named in separate genera of felines, the family. It would not be hard to believe that all lions came from a common lion ancestor. Right, there's a couple different species or subspecies of lions, uh, and there's a couple extinct species that we would group in with lions, Leo, the genus Leo. And it's not hard to imagine that each one of those has a common ancestor. There, there was one lion type in the back that gave rise to gave rise to multiple different lions. Um, 
And all tigers came from a common, common tiger ancestor. So what he's doing here is he's expressing the idea that God might have created a, com, a, you know, a form of tiger, a form of lion, a form of jaguar, a form of cougar, a form of lynx. And each one of those then had the freedom to, through natural selection, you know, Darwin's mechanism, which is acknowledged by everybody and is, is, is accurate in his mind, has been able to take that thing and change it into a bunch of different species, but still within that genus. Okay, so now he's going to try to relate that to like, hell, maybe you don't know organisms. Maybe you're not out there a naturalist, right? But you know cars. Uh, the Ford company makes several lines of cars, such as the Ford, the Mercury, the Lincoln, the Zephyr. You gotta remember, this is 1946, okay? So it's actually a pretty oppressive array of different models, all right, types of Fords. Um, and you'll recognize all those names, except maybe we don't have a Zephyr anymore. Within each of these groups are various minor divisions. There are versions of the, you know, a Mercury. There's a version, there are different versions of Lincolns. There's different versions of Zephyrs, right? And so you can think of them as genera that each have their own species, specific types of Mercuries, specific types of Lincolns. They all have similarities and might be thought of as the Ford family of cars, right? They're all in one big family but you have these separate units that each have variations. The Chrysler Corporation, Corporation makes another series, including the DeSoto, the Dodge, the Chrysler, and so forth. This is another family of cars. We recognize the Ford kind or type as a distinct, as distinct from the Chrysler kind. Hmm, now, now this, is, this is where my mind's getting a little bit, gonna get a little fuzzy. Maybe yours will too, you're reading along. Maybe you can help me sort this out. Um, He's relating Ford, that company, as the kind, right? This is the, the basic type of Ford, and it's distinct from Chrysler's. And then within which, we also within Ford type, we recognize the Ford V8 as a kind different in many features from the Mercury. To my mind, going over that page here, to my mind, the expressions in Genesis apparently mean that plants and animals were created in a systematic orderly relationship. Adam understood God's plan so well that he was able to recognize the relationships at once. The kinds may have included larger or major relationships as well as smaller ones. There may have been the rodent kind and within that, the squirrel kind and the rat kind and others. Ah, all right, so now, you see what he's done here? Um, kind ends up being, there's this broader thing like the family, like the Ford family is one kind. But within that, you have Mercury's, and that Mercury can be a kind of a Ford, right? So that, so, and so I, I think if, if I'm thinking along the lines of Clark here, he's saying naturally you're going to end up with, however, God, you, you can't imagine God making a lots and lots of different organisms without him having like a, like there's a mammal type in his head. Like here's a broad set of characteristics that all mammals are going to share. And then within that, kind that broader group i'm going to create uh, a bunch of subgroups like carnivores and they're going to all have these common set of characteristics and within that i'm going to create um dogs or, or you know canines right and within the canines then they're going to have a bunch of variation and then and so forth right but if this is the way you leave like the definition of a kind, you can have bigger kinds and then you have kinds within kinds because see, he's saying there's a rodent kind and within the rodent kind, there's a squirrel kind, all right? And there's a rat kind and other kinds. So there's, there's a bunch of different kinds within the rodent kind. So God did make the rodent kind, but he also within that kind, so he's just taken Linnaeus and he's saying like Linnaeus has just created categories that represent God's overarching like plan of creation. And he's saying, well, but Adam was like, he's pretty smart. He saw this, like he saw this hierarchical structure and he could recognize this and he could then assign names to the different kinds. But the thing is, we generally, I think most everyone, and I think all, maybe all young earth creationists today are kind of looking at what Adam did as assigning names to the kinds. That would be the basic types of things God made. 
But if you just want to say, well, God made mammals and God made birds and God made uh, you know reptiles and God made uh, synapsids, all right, then, well, what is that? Where does that leave? Like, what variation arose today? Like, okay, you were there 6,000 years ago. What did you see? Did you see all the species? Or did you just see one, like, type of organism that was mammal-like? And that mammal became all those other different things. So, like, how much change can happen? He's saying, well, you know, you can't have change from maybe genera into other genera, right? So the family wasn't made over time. But God instituted the family as, like, this structure, and we're going to call that a kind. So did Adam actually name the hierarchical structure? Did Adam name, like, this is the, you know, ape kind, and this is the, this is the carnivore kind? But then I saw, I was brought five other different animals, and they were in the carnivore kind, so I called them subkinds, like another, I, this is a kind within a kind. That actually ups the workload on Adam in that one day, right? <laughs> it's like, instead of just having to name all the different kinds, right, the individual units that God created separately, then you have to name all the hierarchical structure too. You still are left with the question of like, how much change can happen? Like from the creation of the kinds to the present day, how much did speciation happen? Did species become genera? Did genera actually change from one another to become members of a family? So God didn't create the family originally? You see, you see what I'm saying here? See how this is kind of kind of confusing when you start saying there are larger and ma there are major relationships and more minor or smaller, you know, ones, smaller groups, but they're within, they're nested within, and we're going to call them all kinds at all different levels. All right, this doesn't get any easier because he kind of changes his language again, like literally a paragraph or two later. This viewpoint of the problem removes all the difficulties of the problem of attempting to correlate present species or genera within the original created types. Problem solved. See how I just, what I, what I called kinds? You know, you have a kind within a kind, you know, and maybe you could have species being kinds within a genus. I don't think so. I think what, I think what he thinks is, is genera, genera can have different species that evolved, that changed over time. In this connection, it might it may be pointed out that all the studies that are being made at present on the problem of the origin of species are connected only with the lower categories. Yeah, people study where how species are forming and are concerned only with the lower categories, the subspecies and species and, you know, easy, even maybe genera. No scientific data are being accumulated that throw light on the problem of the origin of the major groups, that is, the families, orders, classes, and phyla. Well, I mean, we don't really collect data on, like, studying the origin of a phyla, uh, partly because there's no special rules for ordering a phyla. If, if foxes and uh, the other canines, they're different from each other, right? But if they're in the same family or the same kind, like Ken Ham would say, they have a common origin. Like there was just two dogs on the ark, two canines on the ark, and uh, now there's foxes and different types of foxes, and there's other canines, and they're all and different kinds of canines. But if you wait around, you know, a hundred thousand years, well, let's say a million years or two, the foxes might have changed so much that they're different families now. But what would that look like? It would just be a bunch of individual species that are each becoming different species. Right? There's no species that's becoming a family. Every species is itself just populations, right? And those populations are changing. So that's why everyone studies populations. It, it, there's no studying the origin of a genus, really, other than the pattern in the fossil record, which is just the pattern of a whole lot of changes of species. Um, so it's not like shocking that that's not being studied. He takes this as nobody's studying how you make a family in order because you're know, like obviously they they realize you can't you know, those things aren't made, only species are made. But we all accept creationists accept that you can make species too. It seems it would seem clear therefore that while there have been changes in species and probably also in genera, the limitations of the change have become quite definite when it comes to higher groups that are reached. There must be a limit because no one can no one is studying those other things uh it's profoundly encouraging 
fact that not only have the evolutionists failed to find evidence for change of one major group into another or the origin of two from more than one common ancestor, we've never found the origin of two different kinds from one kind. Wait a second. I need to know what a kind is before we can talk about what, <laughs> whether, whether there's evidence for that or not. Because if it's two different genera, I think we can come up with a whole lot of evidence that uh, that um, um, tigers and uh, lions probably share a common ancestor. But those are two different genera. All right, we're almost done. Now species of such a different character from those necessary to differentiate families, orders, classes, and phyla that there appears to be no chance for changes to produce any of these major groups. Right, he doesn't think there's any any way any evidence that would suggest that you could change one group into another group, one kind into another kind. Now, just I have to say it again: all that ever happens is one species becomes another species. There's no no genus becomes another genus. You know, like I'm a genus one day and then I'm a genus another day. Um, so one species becomes another species. The the characteristics of those species might be different enough from another lineage of species that we went come along and say, mm, those are so different, we're gonna put you in a different genus now. But the individual species themselves aren't like, I'm a genus and now I'm gonna become another genus. All right, so really, that's kind of it. I mean, this is what he has to say about what a kind is. He, he talks like, oh, well, it's kind of obvious what a kind is. And he kind of sort of relating it to uh, the scriptures. There's uh, God made the different kinds. I don't have, I have no idea after reading this what a kind is. I really don't. Um, but what I do know and what I do want to recognize is that, uh, in, and I want to show you because I think many of you might be under the misconception that uh, this idea of hyperspeciation, that organisms have changed very, very rapidly in a short period of time to make many, many species, even genera uh, of things is a like a fairly new concept and i'm partially responsible for that because i've really been talking a lot about hyperspeciation and post flood rapid uh, speciation uh given a bunch of different names for that um i mean todd wood in particular uh, has pointed out that uh at frank marsh um another i believe some day adventist uh, has also written a lot about uh, of kinds uh, around the same time period uh, and and pro and and you could read, you could read, you could legitimately read him as thinking that a family is sort of the level of a kind. In which case, if he had fully thought through it and described, like, well, then how do you put that into the flood and all that? Well, Noah would have brought on just two members of that kind, and then therefore you'd have to have like all the species we have alive today and all the extinct things that are in the fossil record above the flood would all have had to originated from those common ancestors. And so that hyperspeciation or that super accelerated rate of speciation beyond anything that I think any geneticist or evolutionary biologist would, would think that is possible, uh, would already be present as an idea back in the 1930s and 1940s. Um, and so it has existed in the literature. Now, again, that's the tough thing about history though. It's like how many people knew about Marsh and Clark, like how many people read this book and agreed with this? Um, if you if you were to survey uh, thousands of individuals who had any interest in you know anti well the anti evolutionary um, uh, heavy emphasis on on fundamentalism and so forth, and you just ask the average person, they probably really most of them even at this time might have been thinking still that you know one species is a kind. They didn't have a sophisticated understanding of what that kind might be much larger than that. And then how much influence did Clark and Marsh and uh, Price and others have on the broader evangelical community? Um, so this might have been a very minor uh, viewpoint, uh, which then today has now become a much more common view. I know as Answers in Genesis and other organizations in the last 20 years have, have sort of brought this to the actual public recognition, right? They brought it to the the general audience um, rather than kind of like hiding it. Well, not necessarily hiding it, but it just wasn't like a really important thing uh, to discuss in the past. Uh, Whitcomb and Morris kind of, you know, they allude to 
kinds and families and you know the broad definition of a kind as well but it's very i mean it's literally just like a couple sentences here and there and it's really hard to tell like how much everyone understood what they were saying and whether everyone else believed that at the time all right so there's just one other thing i want to show you from this book yeah this is one of the this is the one of the coolest things about this book so in the middle of the book there's this great uh, fold out right so you got this uh, i gotta back up here really nice uh, fold out and this one's in really good shape uh, and when you fold that out, it's, it's the primary image of the book because it represents uh, the overall um, message, all right, that's being communicated in the book, which is about uh, the new diluvialism as opposed to the old diluvialism. You might wonder, well, what's the old diluvialism? Everything was just like giant flood, mixes everything up, and everything just kind of like sh sorts itself out, right? Sorts out into like certain organisms at the bottom and other organisms at the top. Um, but, you know, it was already kind of apparent that, you know, certain organisms are really heavy, you know, that are at the top. Why didn't they sink to the bottom? And there's little tiny organisms at the bottom. I mean, the whole sorting thing, kind of the hydrological sorting thing, uh, doesn't really work very well once you start thinking about the details. So he came up with this successive burial of ecological zones which is a very common thing you'll hear among young earth creationists today. Now there's still, again, there's still divisions among young earth creationists about what is the primary method for making the geological column, All right? You have the fact of the geological column. Like, this is found here, this is found here. I go to a Grand Canyon and these, this is what is there. Then you have like, well, how do I explain the order of the fossil record? Um, and so they were sort of like, oh, it's mostly random, but it's just sorting. Now, ecological succession is this idea, or ecological zones, this is the idea that there were different ecotypes, right? Different communities in the pre-flood world. And then they were successively buried by the flood. And so that's why you might have like a marine layer at the bottom that has really bizarre Ediacaran flora. So what he has, what this figure is showing is, and this is a little hard for you to see probably, but there's a, a certain flora down here and you see all these, you see all these plants here? This is like the Devonian, Mississippian, you know, uh, sort of like lycopod trees, right? Not flowering plants, not pine trees, any of that stuff. It's like a whole forest. Well, we have actual communities preserved in the fossil record that only have these types of organisms in them, right? There are no flowering plants. There is no pine trees. There's no, you know, it's like they're just not there. And the explanation is, is that, well, there was a there were communities in different parts of the, of the original single uh, continent that only had this community of things. And then there was another place where there was a community that did a different community, like included, here's a community that included ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs, right? And here's a community that includes dinosaurs on land along with some more, mo well, closer to modern trees. And then you have, you know, then you have your, your flora and fauna that is sort of ice age stuff, right? Which could be post flood or some of the oldest stuff could be from the flood. And you also have your upland, um, you know, coniferous forests and so forth. Uh, they're more modern, All right? So he's just—he's not saying these were on, you know, this. This is a, this is just a depiction of like the world could have been patchy, could have had different ecological zones, and then the flood kind of picked everything up. And then here's what doesn't make any sense to me: when I stand in front of an actual column and think about it, somehow one community gets laid on top of another. You know, maybe it's like these communities are stacked up and then there's so much rushing water that it kind of erodes the, I don't know, erodes the, the stuff closer and it lands on top and then the stuff above kind of erodes off and lands on top and then stuff erodes and lands on top uh, and somehow stacks up these ecological zones on top of each other because they couldn't have been on top of each other before the flood, right? I mean, they had to be, they had to be horizontal, you know, to one another. Um, but now they're vertical. Uh, that idea, right, that whole idea, which is now common in the young earth creationist literature, is the new diluvialism or part of the new diluvialism. Uh, so that's 1946. And uh, Price, you can read, go read Todd Wood's blog on this. I'll, hopefully I'll remember to link it below this video. Todd Wood's video, uh, Todd Wood's blog um, 
has a really nice description of the the back and forth hmm, the, the the somewhat acrimonious i'll just to put it nicely um discussion between these two about these different kinds of models right both of which uh, are in some fashion still exist in today's tension in young earth creationism because there are still significant differences between and, and, and viewpoints on the nature of the geological column and its origins. They all agree the flood caused it, but what's the mechanism in the flood that resulted in the order of fossils we see today? Okay, I think that's it. Um, that's my adventure through the new diluvialism. And once again, I want to thank Mark Wilson uh, for this book uh, and the other books that he donated to me. And uh, I'm hoping to uh, be able to, uh, I'm going to learn a lot uh, from Mark because he's a paleontologist who uh, loves bryozoans, right? Fairly, you know, most people find them rather boring, but he's got a lot of interesting tales to tell about bryozoans. Uh, and so he, he knows the Ordovician really well, which is great because that's like down in Cincinnati and I've been talking about that uh, and so forth. But anyway, thanks to him. I want to I just uh, give him a shout out. This is one of what I'm sure will be multiple episodes that will involve something having to do with, with Mark and uh, his work. Thanks. Talk to you later. Subscribe, like, all those good things. That's it. Have a great day. Bye-bye.